While they're taking up the offering, if you would go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, or if you do not have your Bible, you can use your uh, tablet or, or phone and go to fbcclover.life, and you can follow along with the sermon outline and the scriptures there. Do appreciate you being here today. We've been in a sermon series. Uh, this is our second week in this series, and uh, I got to tell you, I wrote this series several months ago not knowing that we would be in a season of loss in our church. Indeed, we've lost some uh, many folks in our church, in our church family, and, who are connect- and people who are connected to our church family. So this passage that we've been in for a couple weeks is, is very applicable to us. God's timing is perfect, and I'm so thankful that we get to, we get to um, study these words today because they are very meaningful to us in this season of our life. Last week, we started our uh, to be or not to be list with two doozies, didn't we? They were, they were difficult to hear. They're difficult to live out, but with the power of God, we can do that. We talked about the importance of being holy, separated for God's intended purpose, and not being used for anything else other than that. And how big of a fight is that? I mean, we talked about that last week. You have to fight for, uh, against your fleshly desires, fight against the cultural wisdom of the day. You got to fight against hurting people, and you have to trust in God's word and and the culture screams a different message to us but we are to be holy because God is holy I told you that God set us up to be holy he gave us holiness through his son he's making holiness real in us through sanctification so we are to be holy then we talked about being loving And that's just as difficult. That's just as big of a fight because our flesh doesn't want to be loving sometimes, right? So we looked at that passage out of 1 Corinthians and we found out that to be loving, we have to fight impatience and fight meanness and envy and boasting and arrogance. We have to fight rudeness and selfishness. And I told you that God loves us and he commands us to love one another. He modeled it through his son. He empowers us through his spirit. So we are to be loving. Today, I want the to-be list will be added to by being diligent and being hopeful. Diligent and hopeful. The word diligent is characterized by a, a steady, uh, earnest, energetic effort, according to Merriam-Webster. I would describe being diligent as uh, keeping your hands and, um, hands and feet moving, being uh, all in, keep your head up, keep your heart, keep your belt tight, fight, your eyes forward and, and moving, and never, ever, ever stop. I don't think that's a complete definition or description of diligent, though, because that can also be used to describe Father Abraham, that song we used at, at Vacation Bible School, or maybe the Hokey Pokey, right? So... I think Paul defines this a whole lot better for us, a a diligent lifestyle in verse 11. Follow along with me. Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Tells us to live quietly. Now this didn't... He's not talking about us having to be a hermit or to go around and not open our mouth and not talk and speak into each other's lives and hold each other accountable. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about being a non-talker. He's talking about your ability to live without being an antagonist, without elevating or causing social discord. Antagonists are so annoying, aren't they? Do you know an antagonist? They live... To agree with the opposite thing that you say. By the way, do you know how to drive an antagonist insane? Do you know how to drive them crazy? Believe or admit that everything they say is right. Agree with them on about everything. Then they can't be antagonistic about anything and they will explode. They can't handle it. So antagonists are the opposite of what he's talking about. The opposite of an antagonist is an ally. Be an ally to people. Helpful to them. Benefit those around you for the good of the gospel. Help one another. Live quietly doesn't talk about living to yourself or as a hobo. It talks about being an instrument of peace in 
in, in your, your circle of influence, being an instrument of peace there, being an ally to benefit those around you. It also talks about, he talks about minding your own affairs. Mind your own affairs. Now, there are times when we have to uh, put our nose in another person's business, especially if we're believers and we, want, and we love one another. We want to have the best for one another, so we've got to be honest and tell each other the truth. But that's after we mind our own business, mind our own affairs. I'm a, I'm a follower of weird news. I look for weird news because uh, I like to read those funny things. And I, I read an AP story this week about some weird news in Chicago that just recently happened. There's a train station in Chicago, Irving Park Blue Line Station, that has been nicknamed Pigeon Poop Station. The pigeons are so bad there that you can't really breathe uh, because of all the things that they've messed up. And so there's a representative, Representative Jamie and, and Andrade, who was given an interview, an interview to the local news there, not offering any suggestions to, to clean it up or any suggestions to the problems, just, just complaining about this station. And while he was giving the interview, you guessed it, a pigeon anointed him with his own type of blessing. You know what I'm talking about. Pigeon poop station. People do this. They complain about other people's messes without, without giving any, any suggestions to, to fix things. They only just point. They never talk about how can we make this better. They only just call attention to the messes. Even Christians do this sometimes. Even Christians can, can gripe about someone else's life and someone else's messes without offering a hand of help or words of encouragement or warning. I think Jesus addressed that. Isn't there something in the scriptures that, say, that says, why are you worried about the speck in another person's eyes when you have a beam in your own? We're to mind our own affairs first. Make sure our lives are in order first. Then we can help those around us who are struggling. So live quietly. Mind your own affairs. But then he tells us, work with your hands. Work with your hands. Monster.com, a, a place where a lot of folks go to, to put their job resume or to look for someone to hire, has an article and they write this. Often people shy away from the blue collar trades precisely because they find that it would be too physically demanding for them. Ironically, it is exactly the physicality of the trades that offers its lucky practitioners amazing health benefits. It goes on to list some of those benefits like longer life, like no sickness because you're building up your immu their immunities or, or good mental health. Those are benefits of working with your hands and doing outside work. So Paul here is saying, work hard. It's good to work hard and get tired. Build something, make something, get tired at the end of the day. I found that if you work with your hands, you have less time to work with your mouth. Maybe you found that too. You get your kids really, really tired. They don't complain so much about being bored. Just don't. So work hard. Be diligent. Work hard with your hands. So he tells them, work hard. Mind your own affairs. Live quietly. But then he gives the benefits of those things in that passage. You have a good reputation. Proverbs 22. A good name is better than great wealth, great riches. But our culture says the opposite of that. Great riches are more important than what people think of you. Well, that's not what the Bible says at all. Luke1428.com writes an article about the benefits of a, of a good name, a good reputation. And there it states that you can add stability to your life because people will trust you when, they, when you have a good name, when you have a good reputation. We know that Having a good reputation can add some eternality to your memory. That's why people who are honest, we call them Honest Abe. Or when people backstab you, we call them a Judas. Whether good or bad, your, your reputation is ongoing. It's eternal. 
It also, in that article, talks about bringing favor. If you have a good reputation and a good name, people will come to your aid when you are attacked. So yeah, a good reputation is a great benefit of being diligent. The second benefit he talks about is dependence, is independence. Now, dependence on God is one thing. That's a good thing. It's good to be dependent upon God. It's good to lean on Him. But to lean on anything other than Him for any extended period of time is not good for us. It makes us dependent upon someone else or some other program for our existence. And that leads to a lower self-esteem, even depression. Dependence on government programs and other people for any long expended, extended period of time is not good for us and not intended for us. Working hard will help eliminate that dependency. So yeah, it's good to live quiet life. It's good to mind your own business. It's good to work with your hands. Because it'll give you a good reputation and keep you de dependent only on God. Here's what I would say about diligence. There may be no fame, but there will always be respect for those who work hard, who mind their own business and live in the background. Won't be much fame there, but there'll be a lot of respect there. So to be or not to be diligent, that's a no-brainer for us. The second thing he talks about beginning in verse 13 is being hopeful. Now modern day cultures have diminished this word hope to a wish. Are we going to win the game? I hope so. Are we, are we going to uh, get that thing we want for Christmas? I hope so. It's just a wish. But in the Bible that word hope is more than a wish. It has some substance to it. The Bible defines hope as a, a definite assurance that's grounded in the fact that God cannot lie. And what He says in the Bible will come to fruition. It will take place. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 and following says, We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. We sang about that anchor a while ago. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Does that sound like a wish or does that sound like an indefinite? That is a definite. It's a noun. It's a real thing. Not a wish. By the way, in Numbers Chapter 23, it says, God is not man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. He has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? It's a definite. So what does 1 Thessalonians say? Look at verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. What helps us? He tells us being informed helps us. All of culture knows this. All of society knows that being informed helps us, which is why in the 1920s, the transhuman push began to come about because people saw that technology attached to a human would be very beneficial to them. And they begin to lay out a plan to attach technology to humans. Today, you can't hardly go across the street without holding information. Can you? That's why our phones have turned into many computers. They give us information at a second. Not only that, hey Siri, tell me who won the game last night. Right? We have those in our homes. Hey Siri, what's the weather going to be today? Hey Alexa, tell me what's on my calendar today. And we're connected to it more and more and more. The next thing is, is they're going to attach it to small implants in our minds so that the information will go straight into our minds. They've already started this by implanting things in our minds that can control prosthesis. Did you know that? Prosthetic arms controlled by someone's mind so they can almost move. 
We're being attached to technology and information at alarming rates. Paul knows that information will help us in hope. You see, the Thessalonians had the wrong information. They said they knew that Jesus was coming, but they thought that their loved ones who died would not get to see that. They had the wrong information. Paul says, be informed. And then he gives them the right information. You see, we have to know the scriptures. We got to know them. Because that's the truth. And when we know the truth, then we can live out our hope, our assurance that what Jesus said is going to happen. He also says, when you grieve, grieve with hope. Grief is a, is a part of human existence. We've known that in our church for the last few months. But what we probably don't know is that grief is good. It's really good for us. Just ask Charlie Brown. Good grief. Grief is good for us because there are stages in grief that lets us express every emotion of the human condition. Can you imagine what would happen to us if we lost a loved one and did not have the ability to grieve? All that emotion would be bottled up inside of us. We'd have to go to the last stage of grief automatically, which is acceptance. And we would just not be able to voice our concern or our complaints or our hurt or our anger. We would just have to swallow all of that and then internally explode because we'd have no outlet. But God, in His infinite mercy, gave us grief. Pastor Dave preached about this at a graveside yesterday, Friday. There are stages of grief that God lets us go through so that our anger, so that our depression, so that our sorrow, so that our begging can go through all of those things. Our full range of emotions is not bottled up. We let those things out until the end, the last process and the last stage in that process, which is acceptance. We can accept it after We've gone through all of these emotional outlets. What a good thing it is that God gave us. And hope pushes us towards that last stage because we know that we're going to see our loved ones again. We know we're going to see our our fellow Christians again. Hope pushes us towards that and pushes us towards acceptance. What a great gift that is. So he tells us, hold on to hope. Hold on to it. You know, in a storm, people try to hold on to things that are, that are, are secure. Like in a tornado, you want to get in, in the, the door frame and hold on to the, the stability of the door frame. Or, or into the bathtub and hold on to the stability of the bathtub. Or your parent, hold on to the stability of your parent. One of my favorite Uh, movies is the movie Twister. Have you seen that movie? It's old, but I love that movie. And the last scene of that movie is is a totally ridiculous scene, by the way. (laughs) Completely ridiculous. These two people, the main characters, they tether themselves to some well pipes that go way down into the ground because the the tornado is coming right at them and they can't escape, so they want to secure themselves so the tornado won't throw them out of the way. So they take these leather straps and they tie themselves and they tie them around the the pipes and this tornado comes and they just sort of get picked up in the middle of the tornado and the tornado goes through and they're like, oh, it's so beautiful. That is totally unrealistic, isn't it? If you've ever had the drawstring of your pajama pants caught in the dryer door, you know what happens, don't you? Just twist. And those people should have just been twisted into little twizzlers. That's what should have happened to them, but they didn't, right? But people want to hold on to something that's, that's secure, that's solid, so that they can make it through that storm in their life. But some people hold on to things that aren't solid, that aren't stable, like their ability to earn or their relationship that could be taken away from them at any moment. So what do we hold on to? We hold on to hope. That solid future assurance of what God will do. In order to be hopeful, we got to stay informed. We got to use hope. We got to hold on to it. I'll say this about our hope. 
read and know the book of the Bible. Read and know the Bible. Because hard times will come, and when they do, you will need something to grasp that will anchor your soul and keep you in a solid place. Remind yourself of the promises of God. He who began a good work in you will complete it. Remind yourself that he will never give you anything more than you and he cannot handle together. Remind yourself that he will always be with you. There is light there. And that light comes from the real presence of Jesus. This is a solid, assured hope that is yours. And nothing can take that away except for God and he will not do it. Non-Christian, I do know what you're going through because I went through it. I know exactly what you're going through. There's a void in your heart. Something's not right and you just can't explain it, but there's just something not right. There's this nagging feeling that there's more to this life than earning a living, than being comfortable, being wealthy, finding happiness. There's got to be something more. That relationship, that thing, that substance, that job. They've all left you wanting for more. And you've searched and you haven't found it. And you wound up here today. I can tell you what you're looking for because I found it. It's a relationship with your creator that may or may not change the external things in your life. You might not get a new job and a new house and Get out of that un overwhelming debt. But you will have a relationship with your creator who will give you peace and assurance through all of it. And that void that you've stuffed so many things into trying to fill will be filled. I promise you, it will be filled if you would just come to God in truth. That everything's not okay. That you do have sin in your life. You do have problems. He knows it. Just admit it to him. And believe that he sent his son to die on the cross for those things. And if you would just accept that gift today, that assurance can be yours. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to be the Lord of your life. Ask him to give you the gift of salvation. And then tell him that you're going to live for the glory of his name. You can do that and that assurance will be yours. Just take it today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. It equips us, makes us stronger and better. Sometimes it cuts us. Even that's for our benefit. Father, help the, the Christians in this room, the believers in this room to live out hope in front of people who can't find it to share the truth of the gospel and the people, with people that are looking for something to hang on to in the storm of their life. Help us as your believers to point them to the real anchor for their soul. And Father, there's some in the room that do not know this peace. They, they don't know it. They've never had it. And they've been looking for it, but they've never found it. But today, they're going to find it. Father, I ask that you would give them the burden to give, them, to give themselves to you. Please do this for their soul's sake. And indeed, if you find yourself in that situation here today, and you've been wondering if there was more, there is. Would you just ask God to save you right now? Just in your heart, in, in your, the silence of your heart, would you just say these words in your words, but make them real. Dear God, I know that I've sinned. And I believe that you sent your son to die on a cross for that. Would you please forgive my sin and be Lord of my life? I'll live according to your rules and I'll do my best not to dishonor your name. So please save me, God, please. And I'm asking you to do this for your glory in Jesus' name. And if that was you today and you meant that, 
That assurance is yours. It can never be taken away from you no matter what. 